Well, our psalm today is actually probably one of the more well-known psalms, particularly for that opening line, you know, um, of the earth giving praise, the heavens giving praise, but more uh, specifically, the ending. It's often used by uh, preachers, actually, before they begin a sermon to, to sort of some kind of Acknowledge may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you. It's a sort of acknowledgement of the ultimate object of our work and, and who we're really preaching before. However, that's a pretty narrow application of King David's intention, who wrote this psalm to be used in worship, actually, to be used uh, by a congregation of people that they would read through it, and then they'd be able to apply the words of this psalm, encourage themselves, and then apply the words of this psalm to everyday life life. David wrote this psalm to encourage confidence in those whom God has made himself known to. So this psalm is actually for you because you have heard God has made or is making himself known to you and you can join the dots if you like of the speechless clues of creation uh, with the spoken word of revelation scripture so that they would change you, change who and, and how you are. This is a psalm of relationship for those who have already encountered the God who makes himself known. So that as they encounter the God who makes himself known, they would be changed from people, from creatures, if you like, who, who think they can hide their lives from God to ones who would find uh, unshakable confidence, a refuge, security, and, and reviving transformation in a, in a relationship with this, this God. As the self-disclosure of God fills them with his awe and then pours out of them in worship through the words of their mouths and the meditation of their hearts. This is what this, this psalm's aiming to do. Their, their external words, their internal worlds are shaped by the God who has made himself known. And God's majesty and character shapes our conduct and our confession. David, uh, Israel's king, and the author of this psalm writes, I think, from his own personal experience. Perhaps no doubt, I think, you know, reflecting back on his time uh, as he worked in the countryside as a, as a shepherd, a shepherd boy who would spend his days and his nights out watching sheep and those kinds of things, but also watching the majesty of creation just cycle through its days and its nights, through its seasons. Nature has a way of making us feel small or silent. It humbles us with its vastness and intrigues us with its variety. It's one of the reasons why I like to just get out bush, to head out bush. Every now and again as you're out there, you encounter something that just stops you. And you marvel at the creative greatness and goodness of God. Also King David, who's writing this psalm, was expected to write out his own copy of the law, like kings of Israel would have to write out their own copy of the law, a law that was approved by the Levitical priests. And they couldn't kind of make it up. They had to make sure it was the actual revelation of God so that it would be uh, with them. And as Deuteronomy says, he shall read it all the days of his life. So that as Israel's shepherd king, the character of God made known in the law would shape not just David's life, but his rule of his people. Most likely, uh, this law that, that David writes is probably the, the speeches uh, that we find in Deuteronomy, those speeches given by Moses, the instructions to Israel as they uh, head into the promised land. In Psalm 19, David would write about the effectiveness of these transformative uh, revelations from God in nature uh, and in his word and turn them into what C.S. Lewis, who's a professor, he wrote Narnia and all those things, but he Professor of Literature, he describes Psalm 19 as the greatest poem in the Psalter and one of the greatest lyrics in the world. David begins his psalm by addressing the universal and general way that God makes himself known through the silent but unceasing witness of creation and how it evokes and stirs in its observer a response of recognition that creation bears witness to the glory and to the and to the intimacy of 
its creator. The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiworks. Day to day pours out speech, night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voices is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. Well, the heavens in this opening verse refers to uh, the dimension of creation beyond the Earth's atmosphere, if you like, the moon, the sun, the stars, planets, the vast unexplored realm beyond David's imagination. And it speaks and captures images in his head of the unending kind of glory of its creator. Here David casts his mind and his gaze up and he encounters something so vast and so distant that neither he nor humanity will ever be able to fully comprehend and fully explore the reaches of it. Even now, with our scientific advances, all we have done is been able to realise that the heavens are far vaster, are far more glorious than David could ever see. Our place in the universe, in a way, with the more knowledge that we add, shrinks day by day. The sun which features in this psalm, uh, the nearest star to our planet, is some 147 million kilometres away. Which is why, even though the sun is 109 times the size of Earth, it looks rather small in our sky. And yet, this small ball brings life to the whole planet. You know, we've had a space probe. I was reading a, a NASA and crazy article on this stuff. Uh, heading towards the borders of our sun's solar system. It's been going for about 46 years, Voyager 1, and it's sort of uh, roughly halfway to the edge of the confines of our solar system, I think. It's been travelling at 61,136 kilometres an hour, and it would take Voyager, allegedly, uh, 130,000 years to fly beyond the limits of our galaxy and out into the universe. The heavens are vast, they're big. The grand irony in light of this psalm is that NASA has actually placed on Voyager 1 this golden record that should it get out there and encounter life, that that life out there might know something about humanity. There's this little golden record, and hopefully that whatever life out there has a, has a turntable that it can, can play the record on. David says the vastness of space and its glory, rather, is telling us something about God, the life giver and creator, who, like the sun, sees all of us, who we are, what we are. He doesn't need uh, Carl Sagan's little gold record to inform him of what, what kind of people we are. The word glory that David uses here can mean weight. The heavens, rather than being this, this static kind of things in their positions, are actually bearing witness back to us about the, the weight and the significance and the substance of their creator. And rather than sending out some poxy little record on a space probe looking for alternative and rather less impressive life forces, we should simply be awed at the one who makes himself known by the immensity and breathtaking grandeur of the heavens and everything that we find in them. The second line of this opening of the psalm is what they call an inclusionary, a way of capturing uh, the all-inclusiveness of the thought. Interestingly, in these opening lines, David uses the same language that we find in Genesis 1, 6 to 8, and he uses the same name for God, El, God Almighty, that we find uh, in the opening parts of Genesis. David adds that the lower atmosphere where the clouds float and the birds fly, the sky above or the expanse, proclaim the handiwork of God. Here is a more intimate uh, description, a more personal one, but no less impressive witness to the glory of God. Consensus amongst ornithologists. Now, there's a sentence I've always wanted to put in a sermon. Ornithologists are people who study birds. Is that on planet Earth currently there is a home to about 35 birds billion birds with between nine and a half to 11,000 species and the largest of these is the wandering albatross it has a, a wingspan of up to 13 feet wide and then down to the smallest of these birds is the bee hummingbird it can fit in the palm of your hand it's like about five centimeters tall only found in Cuba 
all of which is the handiwork of God. And then you've got crazy birds like a, a peacock or a golden pheasant. I started looking up birds. When you marvel at this, you can be like David Attenborough and you can give a kind of a pointless nod to the impersonal and unintentional process of evolution. Or you can be like David of this psalm and know something of the artistry and the creativity of God. David the psalmist, who actually isn't writing to refute a theory of evolution or NASA scientists' kind of low expectations for life other than what is contained in Earth's lower atmosphere, tells us that the witness of creation, it's vast, it, of creation is vast and intimate and it is without ceasing, it is without limitation. It's there declaring and proclaiming and it's an ongoing action that speaks and reveals knowledge without words. The rhythms of day and night speak to the orderliness and, and, the, and the constancy, the consistency of the creator. His thoughtfulness to build into creation uh, seasons that contribute to the sustaining of life on planet Earth. There is no place in creation that this noise, this message cannot be heard or cannot be understood. Their voiceless wisdom is not limited by language or, or geography or ethnicity or politics or socioeconomics. As Charles Spurgeon put it, although the heavenly bodies move in solemn silence, yet in reason's ear they utter precious teachings. Their speechless words teach us something about the God who has made the universe. They pour forth unceasing knowledge about God, the God who is there and makes himself known. And David in this psalm moves on. He focuses in on perhaps the greatest witness in our heavens, the sun. And he uses two metaphors to describe how the sun appears to us mortals uh, some 147 million kilometers away. Firstly, the sun is not another divinity or self-sustaining entity but rather just another part of God's creation that he keeps in a tent. It's not, it's not a scientific explanation, but, it, but it, it kind of explains it the way he sees it. It's a way of describing the place in creation that God has built for such grand bodies like the sun. He conceals its heat at night and he brings it out during the day. It simply does what it was created to do. The sun's role in creation is set forth in the metaphors of a groom or an athlete or a warrior. The idea that being that while it's something to behold, while it's something glorious and radiant and powerful, it's just playing its role in creation. The sun follows the circuit set for it by God and in doing so provides life and warmth to all the earth. There is nowhere in known creation uh, in the earth that isn't reached by, uh, by this one aspect of God's creativity, providing the perfect image, if you like, for the nature of God's own presence. You do not need written words to see the effect of the sun, of its power and its provision. It's, it's evident to all. It stands as a, as a metaphor, an object lesson for the, the presence of God in creation. The first part of Psalm 19 shows us how God communicates his glory and knowledge silently through nature. The stars, the sun, the moon, the oceans and the mountains, the skies full of birds, all speak of God's greatness, making us feel both awe and humility. But to truly understand the God of this silent, divine speech, we need clear and perfect words of the Bible, or the law as it was to David. God has said a lot through creation. Indeed, Paul says it is an inescapable witness, having the effect of leaving people without excuse for, for con con contemplating, thinking about who God is. But God does not say everything through creation. God is a God who speaks. And his speech, his words are transformative. It was God's words, God's speech that turned the chaos into order at creation, that brought life into being that sustains the order of the universe when God wants to bring back order into our lives when he wants to revive our souls he speaks and that speech is captured in what the psalmist calls the law 
The law is a clearer revelation of God than nature because it is the relational, building, covenantal, God's chosen means to bring ultimate reality of who he is and the life-transforming truth to the human condition. As David switches lines of thoughts from one way God makes himself known in creation to another way that he makes himself known in his word or the law, some scholars have thought that this is two separate psalms that have been joined together. However, in reality, as C.S. Lewis points out, it's the brilliance of David to capture and distinguish the, the different styles of revelation using the name of God, El, the writer, that the writer of Genesis applies to capture how God discloses himself in creation and general revelation and then switching over to use the name Yahweh, Lord with capitals, the name that God has given himself as he begins to speak to Israel through Moses. Yahweh is the God who speaks and asks certain prophets to record and make known his will and his wisdom and his character and his campaigns. In verses 7 to 11, David pens very, very, a very dense five verses. There's a, there's a lot in here. There is a list of six synonyms uh, of nouns for God, God's word, and six adjectives describing the quality of God's word, if you like. And these are not to be left in individual importance, but rather are to be held together as a whole to give a complete picture of the identity and the quality and the function of God's word or his law in the lives of people. Connected to this is at least four benefits given to encourage those who have responded appropriately to God's revelation, which David will go on to say are more precious than gold and more satisfying than honey. But just as the speech of creation leads us to a place of humble awe before God, the word of God, his law, his testimony, precepts, commands, the fear and the rules lead us to a place of right living dependence, trust, and salvation in God. <clears throat> well, firstly, God's word, his law is perfect. Perfect in its content, perfect in its effect. There's no lack or deficiency in God's word, in substance or in its ability to renew one's life or to give us a clear picture of who God is. It refreshes, revives, and brings the soul back to where it belongs. It restores and renews one's life one's inner self. Secondly, God's word, his testimony, is trustworthy and a sure source of wisdom. It allows us to see life as God sees it. It comports re reliably uh, with reality, if you like, and allows us to live consistently. The testimonies, they give us wisdom that can be applied to life. The testimonies of God warn us about, about sin. If you, sin. They, they lead us away from destruction. And while I may not speak to every single issue that we confront, they give a, a universal approach to be able to deal with the issues that we approach. Thirdly, the word of God, his precepts, God's uh, guide for living, God's guides for living, his precepts, are right. There is no uncertainty in them. They can always be counted on to provide truth and accuracy. And they give um, assurance in uncertainty and, and the unknown. They make the heart glad. They make the heart confident because they, they can be trusted. They can be relied on to go to in spaces where we're not sure, where we're uncertain. Fourthly, God's word, his command is radiant or pure. Just as the sun gives light to the earth so that we can see accurately, so that we can live well, so the light of God's command gives light to the soul. It has the effect of fighting sin's darkening presence, of transforming our motives from destructive to create, to create even life-giving. Fifthly, and David kind of changes his pattern here, if you like, uh, from, a, from a name for God's word to the overall product uh, the, of God's word. It's some effect, if you like, of all these names, is fear. And this is not a fear that pushes us further away, but one that draws us in, because it has more to do with being filled with awe 
It's about realising just how undeserving of God you are and yet at the same time how gracious God is because he makes himself known to us in ways that allow us to draw near to him, to understand him better, more clearly. To fear Yahweh is to, is to adopt, to, to have come to life in us an appropriate attitude of humility and loyalty and absolute dependence on God. This fear is described as clean or pure. It is without deceit. There is genuine honesty between the fearful and God. They are known to the very bottom and they are loved to the heavens without end. God's word is honest and without hypocrisy. It never changes or is in need of upgrading. Its qualities are eternal as are its effects on our soul. Sixthly, the word of God, the word of Yahweh, his, his rules, now these are his divine decisions about human conduct, uh, what we ought to do and what we ought to be, are reliable and altogether righteous. God's word on human conduct, how we are to express our humanity, comports with his character. It's righteous. God does not mislead or deceive us when it comes to how we are to live, when it comes to, to how we are to be as humans, to express ourselves. God's word is the only true measure of reality and how it is to be human, and what it means to be human. David tells us how the perfect and powerful were the Bible is standing as the ultimate source of truth. The Bible can refresh us and emphasizes the Bible's importance on shaping who we are and what we believe, in particular what we know about God, who he is, what he's like. And all of this leaves David to say that he has found the word of God in all its fullness to be more desirable than gold even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. The word of God is precious and desirable source of living wisdom in the soul, the very character of God for people struggling to know how to live consistently and faithfully in a difficult world. Its content becomes desirable to the one who seeks the benefits of its renewal, its wisdom, its joy, illumination, wonder and truth. And David addresses perhaps the most beneficial aspect of God's word. It alerts us to sin. It warns us of spiritual danger. God's word makes known uh, how we are to live and not live, how we are to walk, how we are to do life and, and not walk, how we are to find joy and avoid sorrow. And after marveling at how God makes himself known through creation and having rejoiced in the admonition and the guidance offered through God's word, David now gets personal. The language changes to personal thinking, recalling perhaps his own struggle with sin, revealing that humanity is in need of God's refuge and redemption. David knows all too well uh, that he is capable of not knowing himself truly or, or capable of actually deceiving himself. The human heart is, is deceitful. He knows that he's capable of committing lazy, unintended sins and also of making active choices that are willful rebellion against the God who has made himself known. David seeks divine assistance to avoid both. Divine mercy to be forgiven of his transgressions, great and small. David knows that without God's intervention, without God making himself known to him, his heart is prone to being dominated and ruled by the standards of society, by his own self-made standards. David knows his limitations and his imperfections, so he asks a limitless God to keep his servant blameless. It's not to say that he's seeking to be perfect, but rather that he would fear God, that he would have this life-changing reverent awe for God and be ruled by his word to marvel and be molded by the God who has made himself known. C.S. Lewis says of the word of God that it reads us. Like we, it reads us more than, than we read it. It will tell you your needs 
and point you to a saviour. It enlightens your eyes and brings understanding uh, on how to live and what to do. It should instruct the words of our mouth and it should inform the meditations of our heart. Ultimately, it should lead us to Jesus, who is the Word made flesh and the personification of all that the psalmist finds transformative and encouraging in a God who has made himself known. David is encouraging God's people, you and I, to be intentional and seek the benefits and the blessings of a God who has not been stingy, but wonderfully generous in his self-disclosure to perceive his silent speech of creation and encounter his spoken word in scripture. A God who would make himself known says that we would encounter him as a rock, a solid, immovable, unchanging, eternal place to stand in, to have confidence in, to do life from, and a redeemer, one who can handle the brokenness and the sinfulness of our lives, reviving our souls and transforming our hearts with wisdom and joy and confidence, repentance and faithfulness. And God, who is more satisfying to the desires than the riches and rewards found in wealth and the pleasures found in appetites. A God who makes himself known to us that we might know him and do life well. Let's pray. Loving God, we thank you that you are not a mystery, that you are not something that we have to go searching for, but rather you have made yourself known to us. You have made yourself known in ways that marvel us in creation, where our minds think, how crazy must this God be? And then you have made yourself known to us in very particular, very specific ways through your words so that we can know exactly what kind of a God you are and how it is that you have designed our lives to be lived and what you have done in order for that to be possible. The psalmist could, could not have imagined uh, that you yourself would come into creation through the Son and, and reveal yourself to us through Jesus and, and bring us back into relationship with, with you through, through your own Son's uh, life and death and resurrection. But we do, we see more than David had ever seen. And our, so our hearts are filled with a greater revelation, a more wondrous understanding of a God who has made himself known. As we go from here today, would we just be mindful of this? Would our, as we do life, would we look around the world and see what God has done is, and bring to mind your word in our lives, in our words and, our, and, and the, the thoughts of our hearts that as we do life with the world, that we too would become people who shine forth the glory of God to a watching world. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.